Renee here from Caravan RV Camping, Australia's favourite online Caravan RV superstore. Today we are on episode 7 of CRVC TV and we are talking about tow vehicles. So we're doing things a little bit different today. We are out in the front here of the Caravan Repair Centre and we've got all the boys' trucks lined up. Um, at least all the tow vehicle ones anyway. So behind me we've got Ranger, we've got Envara, we've got the BT50 Mazda, we've got the Hilux, got a Nissan Patrol and as most of you would have guessed we've got Greg's down here and he has got himself a Land Cruiser. All right so I'm going to flip around and we'll have a chat with Greg. How are you? Hey mate. Hope everyone's had a great week. Okay. Uh, welcome so, to this week's session. So this is Greg's pride and joy here as well as his Jayco caravan. So we're set up. Um, Alright Greg, to begin with, we'll just have a little chat about some road safety and etiquette while we wait for some people to jump online and ask us some questions. Okay, look, that's a really good uh, topic and um, for sure there is certainly some etiquette that you should be um, employing when you're towing a caravan. Quite often we're not moving as fast as the rest of the general traffic, um, so do keep an eye on your mirrors. Um, make sure you regularly keep a check behind you. If you see a bank up of traffic, try to move to one side. Um, if there's a pull-off lane, if it's a very narrow stretch of road, try and pull over and let that traffic go through. Also, um, use the old-fashioned methods of signalling. So that is when you can see clearly uh, the road ahead and you know it's safe for the vehicles potentially behind you to overpass, indicate for them to come round you. Um, those that are running UHF radios, again, make sure you advertise that on the back of your van. That way, um, anyone who's travelling behind you who does have radio communications can call you up. You can advise them of the conditions ahead of you and hopefully move those vehicle, vehicles around you. Um, that way, you're not feeling pressured to move down the road at a faster pace than you're comfortable with and the vehicles behind you aren't getting frustrated um, by the build-up of traffic. So, certainly, if you can employ some just common sense rules and some manners, um, you'll find everyone will get along a lot better. We don't find such road range uh, intervals, specifically with the heavy transport, obviously. They're on a schedule, they have a job to do, um, they're not, uh, not generally on holidays like us, so um, bear that in mind and please give them some room to get around you. Give them plenty of room to manoeuvre when you're passing them with the van um, and just keep those sort of general things in mind as you're travelling. Great, thanks Greg. Alright, we've got a few more people coming on board. So thanks for sharing guys. Alright, we are here talking about tow vehicles with Greg from Caravan Repair Centre. Um, we're going to have a quick chat to begin with about choosing your tow vehicle and just some major things to d consider. Um, first off, Greg, do you want to have a chat about uh, two-wheel drive versus four-wheel and all-wheel drive? Yeah, for sure. So there's a range of vehicles out there. Um, your general two-wheel drive vehicles are like your Holden Commodores, your Falcon Wagons. Um, there's some lighter SUV vehicles um, that are two-wheel drive only. Even in your utilities, you'll find some two-wheel drive uh, units, um, some of the Hiluxes, um, BT50s and what have you do dual versions, not only four wheel drive versions but the two wheel drive versions of them. Um, as far as that goes, generally your four wheel drive units are a heavier unit, so they are a more weighty vehicle and that's something to consider. So when you're looking for a tow vehicle, um, obviously bear in mind the unit that you've got, what weight it is. Um, even those that are capable of towing heavy weights aren't necessarily ideal units. So you, you don't want a vehicle that's a great deal lighter than the mass that you're towing for safety. So if you want a good stable unit, try to get a vehicle that is quite closely matched to the tow weights that you've got. So you don't want a little tiny car with a great big caravan behind it. Obviously there are tow ratings, so certain vehicles aren't able to tow weights above certain degrees. So most have a braked and unbraked uh, weight that they're able to tow and your dealer or your manufacturer's handbook will clearly have that stated what the capacities of the vehicles are to tow given certain load uh, aspects. So uh, as I said there's a great variety of vehicles on the market these days which are quite competent tow vehicles um, right from your dual cab utilities which have become incredibly popular tow vehicles. Um, their comfort levels have come up a lot over the last few years um, their pricing structure is quite cheap for the vehicle you get. 
but do bear in mind not all of the placarded uh, figures that a salesman might tell you are actually are you able to use. So do bear that in mind when you're looking to pick a tow vehicle. Hey Greg, what about transmission and your experience um, towing caravans and, um, and in the repair centre, is there a preference on automatic and manual or is it something that um, really depends on what sort of caravanning and touring we're doing? Look, for sure, both of those apply. Um, although these days, if you're talking about modern vehicles, the modern autom automatic transmission is an incredibly uh, robust unit. Um, certainly in the old days, most people t preferred to tow with a manual gearbox. It was a much stronger item than the old-fashioned autos. Um, that has gone by the by. Even for vehicles such as this 200 series Land Cruiser, it is a far more capable vehicle with an automatic transmission in it off-road than the manual version. Um, the controllability of the vehicle with the automatic transmissions these days is incredible. The speed selection, so most of them are minimum five-speed autos, six right up to eight-speed automatics these days. So um, you get a much better range, a much simpler vehicle to operate as far as you would as a driver goes, and less fatiguing. You're, you're far more rested driving an automatic vehicle around than you are a manual, especially if you've got traffic conditions or long distances to go. So I, I couldn't highly recommend enough a good quality automatic. Um, saying that, there are a couple of things you can do to improve your automatics. People like Wholesale Automatics, and there's a few other really good, reputable operators out there, make specialised valve bodies, which is the shifting bodies for the transmission, which make them far more robust, makes them cleaner to shift, um, more fuel efficient when you're towing heavy loads. Um, those sort of things you can do, as well as coolers. Um, things, as I said, like a 200 series, they don't really need a transmission cooler these days. But there still are some vehicles, when you tow very heavy vans, that recommend a transmission cooler to keep that fluid down, which is one of the big killers of an automatic transmission, is high temperature in that automatic transmission. So you want to try and maintain a, a lower temperature. And some of the aftermarket things like valve bodies and transmission coolers, um, lock-up devices, which lock the torque converter in your transmission, so almost make it like a manual transmission. Um, give you much better fuel efficiency. So there is a few areas to look into when you're buying, but as I said, across the board as a whole, the modern automatic is a fantastic piece of equipment. Great, great advice. Thanks, Greg. Um, okay, fuel, unleaded versus diesel. Um, have you got any advice on fuel economy between the two? Um, performance of vehicle, is there one over the other that is better on a towing perspective? Look, for sure, again. Um, Old rule of thumb, again, petrol versus diesel. Diesel will be a slightly cheaper, or used to be a slightly cheaper fuel source. Um, the torque that you get out of a diesel engine for when you're towing, which is, is the thrust that you're looking at to move that vehicle down the road, you get much better performance out of your diesel vehicles than you, you do your petrol. That again is slowly changing. We've got modern versions of petrol engines which are incredibly fuel efficient. So if you look at something like the new Nissan Patrol Y62, um, their figures are on par of that of a modern diesel vehicle. So the fuel efficiencies, not only that they're getting out of common rail diesels, they're also getting those fuel efficiencies out of some of the larger, heavier duty petrol engines. So um, some people still, and I tend, because of where I travel, um, if you go into the northern latitudes of Queensland or up into the Northern Territory, petrol can get hard to find, especially high grade uh, unleaded petrol can be hard to find in some of the remote communities, um, whereas diesel's generally always available, either they've got farm machinery or their council machinery, so you'll more often than not find diesel where sometimes you can't find petrol. So, you know, looking at it in that vein, certainly if you're a tourer or a long distance tourer or a remote tourer, you may want to lend to your diesel. Um, as far as efficiency goes, cost per kilometre, most modern diesels are still fractionally ahead of most petrol engines, but you pay a premium for that diesel vehicle. So again, depending on the miles you're doing, it may pay you, whilst you pay slightly higher per kilometre, that you're still cheaper to run in the long run than you are um, with a diesel. Um, I upgraded um, from a 100 series petrol Land Cruiser and I just found with the, my touring gear that I like to carry and my van, it 
became very inefficient. So I was getting around 28 to 30 um, litres per 100 kilometres, which was starting to get quite thirsty. Whereas the 200 series, I'm around the 15 to 17 on average touring, uh, maximum 20. So I'm a long way ahead with the diesel vehicle with a lot more power. Um, we just had Neil Barker jump in. Hi Neil, thanks for your question. Um, does adding a snorkel improve fuel efficiency? Sorry, fuel economy. Look, they are rated to add a little bit more fuel economy. Um, they do that by technicality, by ramming a little bit more air down into a modern diesel engine. So um, the diesels run their best and most efficient in the cooler air and the more air. So um, fueling in a diesel engine is very, very critical. You will find, uh, with their rated figures, a slight increase. Generally, it's very unnoticeable. So if you're talking a long trip, you may save yourself 20 or 30 litres over 6,000 kilometres, so you're not really going to noticeably see that performance. Where you will see it is in your throttle uh, aperture. So you may not have to have your foot as hard down on the floor in the same given environment with the snorkel because it gets a slight ram air effect through that snorkel generally, especially if it's a good quality snorkel. Um, there's a lot of technology goes into the design um, of a snorkel. So again, try to avoid the cheap Chinese versions of it. Um, things like your Safari snorkel and AirTech, a lot of research goes into the shape of that snorkel so the air flows into your vehicle at the right rate and in the right design. So um, that can be very important to the snorkel you actually fit. But as a general rule, most people say you will get a little bit more efficiency out of the vehicle with a snorkel fitted. So again, for the $600, not only is it peace of mind for better quality air because the air intake's quite high, so in dusty conditions you're, you're getting far less dust down into the vehicle, but any chance of water if you're on off-road caravaner, um, so they, you know, they generally do pay for themselves in that way. That's a great question. Thanks for that one, Neil. Um, we have had a couple more come through earlier. Herb, welcome back, mate. Um, do you have any good tips when you're doing U-turns or turning sharp corners when towing a van? Okay. Um, tight turning and U-turning can be quite difficult in the van. Um, obviously, as much as possible, try to avoid it. If you are running your weight distributing hitch and you do need to make a very tight articulation or a U-turn, it is worth the time to try and stop if you've got room, take those bars off and conduct the turn. Obviously, the design of your A-frame versus the rear of the vehicle, again, some vehicles, um, I've got to be a little bit careful because I've got a big tyre carrier on the back. With a short A-frame, I could possibly come in contact with the front of the caravan in a very tight articulation. So be very mindful of what space you actually have and where your A-frame, what shape your A-frame is. Those wider A-frames obviously are going to come much closer to the back of your vehicle in a tight articulation and you can end up in a jackknife situation where you cause damage to the back of the vehicle or and the van in those tight turns. Obviously sweep out as wide as possible when you're wanting to make those turns to lessen that angle of attack on the van uh, as much as possible. Frank, welcome back Frank. Frank wants to know what are some regulations relating to towing for our state, which is the Frank's in Queensland, um, does it differ between states? Really good question and certainly it does. Um, each state has their own laws. Um, in Queensland obviously um, anything above 750 kilos has to have brakes on it. Um, depending on the weight of the van, then your safety chain. So those chains have to be suitable to withstand the weight of the unit behind you to restrain it in the event of an accident or it becoming unhitched or detached. Um, above two tonne in Queensland, we also need a breakaway system. Um, in New South Wales, that breakaway system also has to have a monitor in the driver's cab so that you can monitor the, the battery condition and effectiveness of that brake. Uh, safe unit. We don't need that in Queensland. In Queensland, our chains can be level or recommended cross. We don't have to cross them. WA, you have to cross your chains to be legal. Um, so there are a wide range of regulations um, that do vary from state to state, including speeds. Um, in Queensland, 
we're allowed we're allowed to travel um, to the maximum of the placarded sign. So if it's 110 on the freeway, you can do 110. In New South Wales, there's a maximum limit. You're allowed to travel with a heavy caravan on the back. So um, again, it does pay you to have a look at where you're travelling, um, which states you're going to be transiting and what laws pertain to you in those states. Um, generally, ignorance as far as a police officer or Department of Transport officer is concerned is not an excuse um, because you didn't know. So they do you require you to have a good understanding of what the current legislation is and certainly um, the Department of Transport is a great spot to you know, grab all of that information. It will be the most up to date information that pertains to you know, our state. Some good feedback from Herb. Thanks guys. Thanks for the information. Greg will take note of your tips for the next trip. No worries Herb. Greg's, um, Greg's full of information for us. He's doing well. All right. Now, we've had another one from Steve. He wants to know about the awning on your vehicle. All right, guys, we're actually going to have a little look over Greg's van because if there's an accessory for, sorry, car, if there's an accessory for a 4x4, Greg sure has it. So we'll have a little look around and we'll go through. So Greg's got an awning on the side here. What have you got here, Greg? Okay, so I, I operate a Fiamma F35 um, cartridge awning. So that's a solid case. It's a, still a manual awning, so um, the outer shell of the awning operates, you still roll the awning out manually, the legs slide out from the inner tube and pin back to the vehicle. Um, they're very similar in operation, these awnings, to a bag awning um, that you see on most modern four-wheel drives and they've become incredibly cheap to buy, um, fantastic for quick setups on the side of the road or if you've just got your vehicle camping, offer lots of shade. Um, I can set my awning up and put my swag down underneath it um, and set up for free camping away from my van if we want. Um, as I said, the other alternative to this is the larger brother which is called an F45 and it's a more automatic awning. So you have a crank handle that you put into one end of the awning and it will automatically project itself. You still have to drop the legs down but the actual projection of the awning and setup is all done just via the crank handle. So a really, really good option. Um, I then run a rooftop basket, again for uh, storage and fitment of equipment. Um, some people mount these straight off their roof racks, which is quite, quite fine. You'll see a lot of utilities these days. You can get little brackets that have come part of the awning kit to mount them. Um, from there on my roof rack, um, my awning has is, is actually got what's, what's known as a Fred's arm. So I can relocate this awning from the side of the vehicle. Uh, when I'm doing camping across the back of the vehicle. So if I want to open up the back and operate my fridge and kitchen uh, in inclement weather, I can relocate the whole awning just by a swinging of an arm to the back of the vehicle. It's can a very, very quick operation. Where about that's located? I'll just show you quickly. Oh, perfect. So I just keep a couple of safety straps. Again, really good idea. Double sided tape from Clark Rubber, fantastic piece of equipment for safety maintaining. So I can just swing my awning straight round and relocate the awning straight across the back of the car and unroll Perfect. it. So again that gives me complete coverage for the rear of the vehicle. I run an 85 litre fridge on a drop down slide. Um, with draw slides, so I've got my barbecue, I've got my fridge, um, so I'm set up for kitchen operations. I use my back uh, tailgate as a table, so it works really, really well uh, on my vehicle. Um, I also mount off my vehicle a high lift jack, so the roof rack supports my high lift jack um, should I get stuck and need to change a wheel in off-road situations. Um, it keeps my max tracks, which I don't only use for my vehicle but for the van as well. So if I do find I'm on a sandy track and I get a little bit stuck, I can just quickly whip those max tracks off, put them down, saves using the winch um, or overly lowering the tyre pressures down sometimes and it's a very quick recovery. They work fantastically well and again there's a couple of different versions of exactly the same products um, these days which work fabulously well. Right, who else wants to go camping with Greg? Um, I then also have a mount for my... Um, high mount flag, so again if we're in the desert or sand dune country we run a large flag up off that point which is an identifier so that 
vehicles coming the opposite way over sand dunes up, we're not likely to have a head-on accident. So again, it's, it's clear identification, we're in the area. Um, it's about five and a half metres in total, the length, so I run it off the top of my roof rack, which gives me maximum height. Um, a lot of mining vehicles, they call them sand flags. Said again, very cheap, very good idea in those sort of conditions. Um, internally in the vehicle, um, which might be a little bit difficult to see, I run solar shields on the rear end of the vehicle, which again keeps a lot of the heat, uh, UV light out of the vehicle. Um, it's fantastic again if I'm camping um, without the van by myself. I've got a full set of screens I can put those up, keeps the vehicle nice and cool and quite dark. Um, I find particularly in the summer when the sun comes up at sort of 4.30 in the morning, it's not necessarily the time you're wanting to rise, so it helps you sleep in those extra few hours, makes the vehicle a lot more comfortable. Also means the vehicle air conditioning is not working quite so hard because the vehicle's got some natural insulation with those up in it. So. Yeah. Okay. Um... Somebody, I saw something. Clearview, yes. Are the Clearview mirrors good for towing? Which is what Greg's got on here, actually. Clearview mirrors are, again, another fantastic item. Um, they're not a cheap item, but I think well worth, well worth the investment. Um, they're great to buy or purchase when you're buying the vehicle. You, you don't see that cost quite um, so significantly because it's built into the overall price of the vehicle. Fantastic, uh, both convex and your standard mirror. So you get um, your long vision as well as your tight vision down the side of your vehicle, especially with the 200s, they're quite a large vehicle, so it can be difficult sometimes to see smaller vehicles around you. Um, super simple to use. So you go from the condensed version, non-towing, if you want to tow, you simply slide the mirror out, you're ready for towing. Uh, okay. And it can't get simpler than that. No straps, no magnets. They don't vibrate. Um, they operate with you, still can get your indicated. They're powered mirrors, so all your power mirror um, equipment inside still operates through them. Um, as I said, fantastic device. Great setup from the guys at Campify. Thanks, boys. Um, Travelling around the front of the vehicle, uh, I operate some LED light stripping. So uh, a long ray of LED lights, long distance on the roof. I also have a shorter LED light bar on the front with some long distance HID lights. Um, I find the combination of lighting um, absolutely ideal for the sort of work that I do, um, particularly uh, late night beach work, if you do any of that sort of work, or forestry work. You really get the natural deformations in the roads, so the tracks are almost like daylight. You, you can pick every single pothole or bump. Um, you don't tend to fall into holes which you wouldn't see with the normal headlights, even on high beam. Um, so again, fantastic. Um, as far as the front end goes, steel bull bar, great addition again. Not only are they a great mounting platform for a lot of equipment, um, but super rock solid. Uh, and again, try and invest in a good quality known product there. There are a lot of them on the market these days. Um, so they'll support winches. I run a 12 and a half thousand pound uh, worn winch in this vehicle with Dohema rope. Um, again, I find the Dihema rope a lot lighter uh, than the steel cable um, and it's a really good life. It also doesn't have the same sort of recoil problem that you get with steel cable as far as that danger factor should a cable snap suddenly. Uh, it's not likely to recoil back into the vehicle um, and potentially injure one of the passengers in the front seat, be you as the driver or someone in the front seat. Um, and from there I've got a little bit of under underbody protection, some very secure tow points and again um, should you get your van stuck and you need to pull it out I can re unhitch reverse round and drag the vehicle out of a, a situation if, if necessary um, I can also be recovered by that so if I've got the van on um, with the cruiser you know I'm looking at about a six ton all up weight I need something very solid that if I'm going to be dragged out if I'm stuck that I don't do damage to the vehicle that the vehicle will be able to be dragged forward um, so to get the van and myself out or just uh, just the vehicle out should it get stuck. So, but, um, and on top of that, um, obviously I do run a snorkel, so it keeps the dust down. Um, as I said, also does improve your fuel efficiency um, and gives you um, general um, water forwarding capabilities where you're not worried about sucking water, particularly into a diesel engine, which can be quite catastrophic should you get water down into your engine.
Neil Barker has just asked, are you really allowed to mount the LED lights above the bull bar like that? Look, there's a lot of conjecture on where they are. I run a very low profile set of LEDs, obviously. Um, I've had them operating on this vehicle now for three years. I've had them on my previous um, vehicle. As I said, um, the legislations are quite different and, and how you read them is, is almost up to interpretation. It's the same as you notice, I don't have split LEDs. Um, there are some conjecture that you should have a line between your LEDs. Um, said my antenna is mounted above, so the difference between an LED light mounted above the bull bar and your antenna is really no different. So, as I said, um, you would have to go very specifically into your direct ADRs on that. I find that particular mount pattern works perfectly. It's very safe. Um, so again, you know, if there is any illegality on it, I'd rather err on the safety side of things, and I find that a very safe installation for the way I operate my vehicle. Thanks, Greg. All right, that might wrap us up for the day. Do you have anything else to add in for your four-wheel drive sector today, Greg? Look, as I said, as Renee's pointed out, there's a great variety of vehicles out there on the market. Do plenty of research, find what suits your needs. Um, listen to the salesmen, and then if you've got access to it, go online and see the reports on those vehicles. As I said, uh, a lot of the modern utes are a three and a half ton tow. Doesn't always mean you can tow a three and a half ton caravan. Um, the, the main things that control that are the GVM of the vehicle, your ATM of your caravan, and put those together as a combined gross mass. Um, a lot of vehicles have a pre-described gross mass, so when your vehicle is at its maximum GVM or maximum loaded weight, you may find the caravan weight that you can tow is reduced. So it's not always three and a half ton, even though it's legal to tow three and a half ton, you're not legal to tow it when you're at your maximum weight. So in some of these vehicles, um, that maximum weight is quite easily reached, so be very mindful and do some research to make sure that the van that you're going to be towing with and the vehicle weights that you have are still legal. So things like your 200 series Land Cruiser, its, it's empty weight is around 2,675 kilos. It's allowed to be 3,300 kilos loaded which therefore allows you to tow a three and a half caravan because the combined rating for the two units is 6,800 kilos. On my vehicle, I have a lot of accessories. I have nearly 800 kilos of accessories sitting on this vehicle um, to do the sort of work that I like to do. That means I had to get a weight upgrade for its GVM because it sits empty as it is in the car park here at three and a half ton where it should be 3,300. So I had it engineered I'm allowed to carry 3,800 kilos in this vehicle. But when I do that, I'm only allowed to tow a 2,900 kilo trailer behind me. So even for a big vehicle like this, I still can't tow at that uprated GVM, a three and a half ton caravan. So it is something to bear in mind to make sure that the weights you're carrying are completely legal and therefore keeping you and your family safe. That's great advice. I think a lot of people go out buying vans because they know that they've got a 3.5 tonne towing capacity, but it's not really the case sometimes. You've really got to take into account all these accessories you put on, guys. All right. Well, thanks for today, Greg. That's been really insightful. Pleasure. Look forward to seeing everyone next week. All right, guys. Next week is episode number eight, and we're actually going to talk about caravan renovations. So we've got our workshop over here. We've got a few stripped vans there. The boys do a lot of renovations here um, and have done over the years. We've um, rebuilt some retro vans, and we've also built some brand-new retro vans um, as replications. So we've got um, a lot of vans that come in, transit vans that we fit out completely and that's a really big thing in the market at the moment. A lot of people are wanting to um, build their own camper so any questions you've got in relation to that shoot them through this week and I'll ask the boys and we'll get back to you next Tuesday at 2pm. Thanks for tuning in guys. See ya.